Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this lecture. Uh, so this is a lecture that is given uh, within the framework of the Cher Jomot that this year has been assigned to Professor Ila Kolmanowski from University of Michigan. So the, uh, this is the second lecture of a series uh, of uh, four lectures. So the first one was uh, on uh, automotive technology. Today it's uh, on the connections between game theory and automotive technology. And the next two will be one on uh, aerospace and the last one on flexible aircraft. So um, Professor Kolmanowski is uh, here for more or less one month and a half within this chair and is collaborating and discussing with various groups at ULB and beyond ULB uh, for possible uh, future collaboration. We have already given uh, also one workshop a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, just to give a small introduction to uh, Professor Kolmanowski. So Professor Kolmanowski uh, studied at the University of Michigan. He did uh, his PhD there, where he contributed uh, to the theory of control in a quite fundamental way. After that, and this is one of the reasons we are particularly happy to have him here in the chair, after that he spent for almost 15 years, uh, his, uh, the rest of, almost 15 years of his career within the industry, working at the research center of Ford Motors uh, in Deborn in uh, Michigan. And uh, during this period, uh, he kept publishing uh, in a quite impressive way, but also contributed uh, to the, the actual development of products. He is author of more than 400 papers and more than 100 patents. And after these 15 years in Ford Motors, uh, he was back at the University of Michigan in the Department of Aerospace, where he is uh, now full professor since uh, 2010, if I remember well. Um, so uh, he has won number, a large number of prizes and he is very involved in the control and aerospace community. He is editor of many journals and he has also served an important position in various societies of our field. So it's really my pleasure to introduce him and to have him here. And uh, so I leave the word to him. Thank you very much uh, for a very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and uh, um, talk about a uh, topic which is hopefully a little bit of fun in terms of game theory and uh, what it could possibly have to do with uh, automotive uh, vehicles, so how we can uh, take advantage of it uh, in automotive uh, um, vehicles. Uh, I'm um, going to talk about a number of things. Um, first, I, I'm not assuming any background in game theory on the part of the audience. So I'll give a very short uh, five minute introduction just to give a flavor of the type of ideas that are involved. But the main focus of my talk is uh, how some of these ideas can be applied uh, to the control of automotive vehicles. And I'll go through several examples based on, on the past work. Uh, and this will be emissions and fuel economy optimization for engines energy management and hybrid electric vehicles, and uh, automated driving. And at the end, I'll finish with some of the concluding remarks. Game theory is the study of uh, mathematical models of strategic interactions among rational agents. That's the formal definition of uh, game uh, theory. And its origin can be traced to a paper by von Neumann on the theory of games of strategy, as well as uh, the book by, by von Neumann and uh, Morgenstern theory of games and economic behavior. And as you can guess uh, from the title of the book, um, um, theory of games and game theory is uh, broadly used in, uh, in uh, economics. Okay. Um, let me uh, jump to an example just to illustrate what's involved in a fairly simple uh, leader follower Stackelberg uh, game. Uh, we have two players, so we typically have multiple agents that interact, and we, in the simplest kind, we have two players. One of them is the leader, and the leader selects an action, and the action is going to be denoted by, by W. Uh, and the leader would like to maximize a cost uh, function of some kind, which is denoted by capital J. 
Uh, there is a second player who is the follower, and the follower reacts to um, uh, to uh, um, the uh, action of the player. So it knows W and reacts by picking its action, which is uh, denoted by small u, uh, to minimize the cost. Now you could have different rewards for both players, but this is a very simple setting where uh, the cost function is is the same. Um, so what happens in such a situation? Well, if you think that the agents are rational, uh, then um, the player two, who is the follower, uh, would uh, try to think in the following way. Uh, suppose uh, the uh, a leader takes an action W, then what I need to do is to find an action uh, U hat, which uh, minimizes my, my cost because the uh, second player wants to minimize the cost. Uh, and that results in a policy uh, which, uh, given W, gives me the value of the action uh, U. Now, the leader knows that uh, the follower is going to react rationally. And uh, what uh, does it mean? Well, it basically knows the follower strategy and it can uh, minimize, um, it, it can maximize uh, the uh, minimum of that uh, cost. Uh, with respect to you, to, to you. So there is a, um, we plug in uh, u hat uh, into the cost and then we maximize it with respect to w. Just a very simple example. Uh, we have uh, um, player one picks a value of w between one, two, and three, and u picks a value, can pick value one between one, two, and three. And this is a payoff matrix. Uh, so for example, if player one picks uh, one, and uh, player two picks uh, two, then uh, the value of the cost j is going to be zero. This is how this basically works. Um, and so um, if you want to construct the optimal response by the follower uh, to um, um, an action by, by the leader, so if leader picks one, uh, then the best that uh, the uh, um, uh, player uh, two can do to minimize the cost would be to pick the action uh, two. Uh, if um, um, the leader picks two, then uh, two is the second uh, uh, picking. Uh, picking the second uh, move is the best uh, action by player one. And if uh, um, W happens to uh, to be three, then you could uh, you have a choice because these values here are, are the same, so you can pick either one or three. So there's the the strategy doesn't have to be unique necessarily. Okay, and then um, these are the minimum values of the cost uh, with respect to u as a function of w. And it's clear from this picture that um, if uh, the leader wants to maximize this value, it better pick uh, w equal to 2. So optimal play by player 1 is going to be 2. Um, and then uh, optimal play by player 2 is going to, be, uh, going to be 2. So this is basically how some of the situations in the simplest possible case work. Uh, now, uh, the values of u star w star that be constructed, if you evaluate the cost on them, you can show that this is between uh, mean uh, with respect to u and max with respect to w, and max with respect to w and mean with respect to u. If these two bounds um, happen to be, uh, to be equal, then you have the so-called Nash uh, equilibrium, uh, named uh, uh, after John, uh, John Nash. It's a uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, um, basic uh, and very familiar concept in the game theory um, that's often uh, used. And the idea of Nash equilibrium is that uh, uh, any unilateral deviation from the play by one player degrades the, that player payoff. So each uh, player's play is the best response to Nash equilibrium actions of uh, other players. Now, if you briefly look at this example, it uh, turns out that uh, uh, mean max is not equal to max mean. And so here Nash equilibrium doesn't exist, um, while the Stackelberg equilibrium does exist. Uh, that's not necessarily a problem because if you, um, um, you can show that Nash equilibrium does exist if you uh, convert this problem to its uh, probabilistic variant, uh, basically use a so-called mixed strategies. Um, and you can uh, also, uh, um, if you modify the payoff matrix, you could uh, also find uh, a Nash, uh, Nash equilibrium if you modify the last, uh, last row of the payoff matrix. Um, so in this particular case, uh, then the um, U star is equal to 2, W star is equal to 2 is going to be also the Nash, uh, uh, the Nash equilibrium. It's a saddle point in a sense that um, um, this value here, it's a largest value along the column and the smallest value along the row. So 
that's basically the interpretation. Um, I realize this is a, a you know, very quick introduction into a very complex and extensive subject, but just to give you a flavor of what's involved, um, the talk is going to be about applications. Now, many applications, I would say majority of applications of game theory have been in uh, economics, uh, and in fact there is a, a list of uh, Nobel Prizes in, in, in economics um, that, that, uh, that um, uh, has been awarded. Uh, and uh, just something on the light side, uh, there is a classical uh, uh, classical movie, The Princess Bride, and there is a battle of wits as a part of that uh, movie that uh, that is quite interesting from, from game theory perspective. I think they're trying to decide who's got a glass uh, with a poison in it, and uh, ultimately there's an interesting ending there. Okay, I'm not going to talk about... Um, applications in economics, uh, but actually what I'm interested in is to tell you a little bit about how these ideas can be um, exploited for automotive uh, vehicles. And I'll start with some of the basic problems related to engine, powertrain optimization, uh, transition to hybrid electric vehicles, and then I will show you a little bit about how we rely on game theoretic models for autonomous driving. So I think the last part will be, will be probably the most interesting. Uh, but uh, I want to start with some of the more basic ideas um, and take you kind of to back to late 90s and uh, early 2000s, where what we were interested in doing is trying to understand how to optimize the operation of the engine uh, in terms of emissions and fuel economy performance. And uh, uh, what happened at the time is that the uh, emissions and fuel economy performance were assessed over specified drive cycles. So there were certain drive cycles, uh, for instance, new European drive cycle or, or something like this, where you have um, a vehicle speed profile uh, uh, prescribed as a function of time. You might have a vehicle, you put it in a chassis rolls, and you basically measure fuel consumption and emissions, and you try to optimize the calibration to, to, uh, to reduce fuel consumption and also meet uh, emission, emission regulations. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, what happened at that juncture is that uh, we started to realize uh, that uh, uh, the storage elements in powertrains uh, are becoming more and more important. And at uh, that time, there were more advanced catalysts uh, that, that were appearing. Um, and they, they would store emissions and then uh, hybrid electric vehicles which would have batteries and they, they store, the, they store the charge. And they play a more fundamental role in understanding how to optimize the fuel economy because your fuel economy is not just a function of your current um, operating condition, but also history. So essentially, it it's a, it's a, becomes more of a dynamic system. Now, in that setting, a dynamic programming turns out to be a very useful um, a tool for um, such, uh, such powertrains. And uh, uh, I, I suspect that many of you may have seen dynamic programming either from optimization courses or from uh, actually computer science uh, or basic programming uh, uh, courses. So it's the same idea that we are talking about, um, about here. Now, the trouble uh, is, uh, or difficulty um, using dynamic programming, um, well, actually, there was a positive side first to using dynamic programming. It's a very useful tool to be able to characterize best achievable performance over a specified drive cycle. Um, so if you want to know the best possible uh, fuel economy you can achieve, uh, dynamic programming will, will be able to give you that, that result. Uh, but the policies that dynamic programming produces, uh, they were functions of uh, our storage states, that was fine, but they were also functions of the specific drive cycle and time over, over the particular drive cycle. Now the cars are not driven on a drive cycle, they are driven on the roads, and so it's not clear how to apply these solutions to, uh, to vehicles on the road. Um, and uh, so for implementation control policy, which is not dependent on time and specific drive cycle is very desirable. Uh, and our initial look at the application of game theory has been really motivated by the need for such drive cycle and time independent solutions. Another approach that we have uh, pursued uh, was um, using stochastic dynamic programming, but I'm not going to talk about it um, uh, today. 
So, uh, so how, how to uh, pose this problem uh, so that uh, we could uh, look at it from the perspective of game theory? Uh, well, the first look at the problem, perhaps you could think about a driver or drive cycle being one of the players uh, and the en engine or the powertrain being the second of the second player. So that's one uh, perspective that could be uh, interesting. Uh, now, uh, if you think about real-world driving, uh, the driver really is moving with a traffic flow and is typically not actively engaged uh, in reducing fuel consumption or emissions or trying to do the worst possible uh, job in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, um, you know, uh, maximizing either fuel consumptions or emissions. Uh, Perhaps hypermilers, it's, it's a, an exception that they're actually trying to reduce fuel consumption, but uh, uh, typical drivers don't, don't do that. And so what uh, that highlighted uh, the need to do is to design a cost in such a way uh, that in addition to fuel consumption and emissions, it must somehow penalize uh, unusual driver actions so that the worst case is, uh, becomes, becomes reasonable. And so, uh, at that time, we decided to look at a very interesting engine, which is uh, called um, a direct injection stratified charge uh, uh, engine. And this engine uh, can operate with a uniform air to fuel ratio distribution in the combustion chamber. Uh, for example, 14.6 stoichiometry, and that's um, similar to a normal uh, gasoline engine. Um, but it's also able to do so-called stratified uh, combustion where you inject fuel late uh, in uh, compression stroke and it doesn't have enough time to mix with air. But if you time things in the right way, you can obtain a situation where near the spark plug uh, you have um, um, a combustible mixture, uh, but then as you go out, outside, you end up with uh, increasingly leaner mixture, uh, more and more air, um, and so the overall uh, air fuel ratio in such a case can be um, quite um, uh, quite large. So it's uh, what, what we call lean. And that has an advantage just in terms of fuel uh, economy because you can operate with more air. So you, you reduce pumping losses and you also reduce some of the thermodynamic losses. So that's what, what was of interest at the time. Uh, now, the trouble with such an engine uh, is that uh, the conventional three-way catalyst um, is not efficient for conversion of uh, oxides of nitrogen or NOx emissions. So you have to run in stoichiometry for the catalyst to be able to convert all the species. Uh, but here, if you run uh, lean, um, you are not able to do it, so there has to be a special device added, uh, a special catalyst, which was uh, called lean nox trap. And what this lean nox trap does is that when you run the engine stratified or lean, uh, it will store oxides of nitrogen. Uh, and then when the trap becomes full, you have to periodically regenerate it, and you do it by running the engine uh, rich, at rich air fuel ratio and you put a reductant uh, through the Linux trap and it actually converts uh, stored, um, um, stored NOx to nitrogen and, and basically CO2. So it's an it's a interesting device, but the reason it's also interesting from control perspective is because there is a storage dynamics, there is a state that corresponds to the amount of NOx stored. Okay, so how do we deal with the situation? How do we apply the game theory? So we need models, we need costs, uh, uh, functions and then we need to understand how to define an appropriate concept to, to deal with this. So first uh, about the models. The models have to be reasonably simple and that's typical in optimal control, typical application of dynamic programming like things is that you cannot use very high complexity models. So you need to reduce um, the model complexity and we've done a number of simplifications uh, such as uh, taking faster dynamics in the system, consisting of the engine and um, the after-treatment system, uh, and replacing it uh, by static mappings. So the engine actually was a faster subsystem, uh, and we replaced it by a static relation that would go from inputs, such as if your ratio, EGR8, uh, spark timing, and so on and so forth, to outputs, which would be, for example, uh, emissions and, um, and temperature. Uh, this would be just a static mapping. And so then the states would be really the amount of oxides of nitrogen we store in the Linux trap, as well as oxygen that we store in a, uh, in a catalyst and in a trap. There is also storage behavior of oxygen in the system. 
Now, the other um, uh, simplification that we did was to restrict action to selecting one of predefined engine operating modes in which calibration is optimized. So pretty much what we are saying is that suppose our engine can run in four modes, stratified, lean, homogeneous, stoichiometric, and purge that are defined by a range of air fuel ratio. And in each of these modes, except for purge mode, we are going to uh, optimize the uh, um, a setting of the inputs to give us the best fuel um, um, economy. Um, and uh, the settings would change because engine speed and engine torque are going to change. And then in purge mode, we would try to um, um, optimize the calibration for fastest possible uh, uh, purge of the, of the trap. So that's a simplification. Okay, so action of player one uh, in this setting is deciding on engine speed and engine torque. That's a driver or drive cycle. Uh, and action of player two is deciding on one of these engine modes. So there's really four possible actions from which you can uh, which you can select at any given time. So. Uh, the um, uh, in terms of um, the uh, now the um, the game that, that we are playing, we have a dynamics. Uh, here's the state, and these are the stored oxygen and stored NOx. We could also include temperature in, uh, in here as well. Um, and uh, this is the next st next state. Uh, T is time, and the next uh, state is going to be a function of current state. Um, mode that the powertrain selects, and then the uh, um, the engine speed, engine torque that uh, the first player uh, selects. Uh, now here, uh, one difference with a simple example that I showed that this is a multi-move game, so you play for multiple moves, and the horizon of the game is uh, uh, given by capital T, and there is a cost function that we are going to select in a certain way. And so we want to minimize or maximize, depending on which player that is, this uh, cumulative cost. Uh, now the player W, the leader, wants to maximize the cost. The player U, which is the follower, wants to minimize this cost. Um, and um, the information structure of this game is such that at time T, the player U knows the state and knows also the move of uh, um, the player W, the leader. Um, now, as this is a multi-move game, um, we have to extend the idea of Stackelberg equilibrium to the multi-move game, and the specific way of doing this that we chose is using the so-called feedback Stackelberg equilibrium, uh, which uh, corresponds to doing this iterative uh, minimization maximization with respect to our moves of this uh, of this cost. And if you look through the papers, we rationalized why we felt that was uh, was a good setting. I will uh, not discuss in too many details uh, how we uh, then compute the policies. I'll just mention that if you're familiar with dynamic programming, this is basically dynamic programming like iterations where you look at uh, the cost to go or the value function, which is your optimal uh, cost uh, from uh, um, accumulated from time t to the end of the horizon, and you have backward in stage iterations to, to construct it. So the nice um, nice feature of this feedback Stackelberg equilibrium idea is that it allows you to basically do dynamic programming like things. Now, how do we uh, apply um, apply this to our engine? Uh, so the key is, of course, picking the right cost function. And uh, so the, the cost function, this uh, script L, uh, we choose it as uh, looking at the fuel consumption of our engine. And then um, uh, NOx emissions that go into tailpipe, so the output of lean NOx trap. And then there is a trade-off uh, weight here, which is lambda. And uh, that's the cost. Now, this is good for um, the, um, the engine. Uh, now, if we just use this cost in square brackets, uh, what's going to happen is that the player, the second, uh, the, the first player, the leader, will always choose high speed, high uh, torque conditions because this is where the fuel consumption and NOx are, are largest. So again, you have to carefully design the cost to, to give you the right results. And in this work, we chose to scale this uh, cost by one divided by basically engine power. Engine power is essentially they're the product of engine speed and engine torque. They're using indicated power here, which is which is a detail um, that uh, that uh, that's not uh, super important. So this is the design of the cost, uh, and uh, then um, 
we can sort of turn the crank uh, on the computations, construct the feedback stack of that policy of the follower. Uh, that policy is going to be a function of time, uh, as well as the state and action of the leader. Um, however, we need a control policy which is time independent. And uh, during my first lecture, I talked about model predictive control. And this is also what we do here. That is, we define the control policy by uh, the very first uh, move uh, in, this, in this particular game. Um, and uh, that's what we um, end, end up using. So here are some uh, results from uh, this optimization. Um, and what I'm showing here, it's engine speed, engine torque. So it's a plane. Uh, and there are cells uh, partitioning this uh, plane. And in each of the cell, uh, there is a number. And this number corresponds to uh, the uh, uh, policy of selecting one of these uh, modes, stratified limb homogeneous, stoichiometric, and purge. And this policy is also a function of the state. So this particular table is for uh, when a Linux trap is empty and uh, a three-way catalyst um, is full, uh, that is, the oxygen storage is uh, full. And then if um, LNC is uh, uh, Linux trap is uh, full, uh, uh, so up to capacity of stored uh, NOx, uh, then you could see we, we are doing basically the, the, the purge. So it's a reasonable uh, behavior on the part of these policies. And so you could uh, uh, look at uh, simulating these policies of a drive cycle. Uh, at the time, we were looking at a new European drive cycle as the primary target. Um, and uh, um, you could uh, sort of uh, see the, the trajectories of the states. Uh, this is uh, typical purge cycles, uh, kind of fill uh, and purge cycles of the lean nox trap. Uh, and this is the uh, control action that's chosen uh, through, this, through this mechanism. Now, there was a trade-off parameter, which was uh, this lambda nox, the weight, and you could adjust it. And if you have a particular level of uh, uh, NOx in terms of gram per kilometer in mind, you could adjust it so that you um, achieve that level um, and uh, uh, then you can read off uh, the, the uh, fuel economy, fuel consumption in terms of miles per gallon. Uh, now, we used only four modes. Uh, you could make the problem a little bit more complex and uh, perhaps increase the number of modes. Uh, you could use, for example, eight modes uh, here. Uh, and these additional modes could be optimized uh, for trade-off between fuel consumption and uh, feed gas NOx emissions, engine out emissions. So you could give a little bit more resolution to behaviors in this case. And uh, just with eight modes, you're able to get about two miles per gallon improvement in constrained fuel economy uh, as, a, as compared to these four, with using four modes. It's still one mile per gallon short of optimal achievable uh, um, uh, Fuel, uh, fuel economy that you get from dynamic programming. Uh, however, the important part here is that uh, the game theory-based uh, policy that uh, we design is uh, time and specific drive uh, cycle independent. So basically, it's something that you could uh, you could implement. So this was uh, the first uh, example I wanted to uh, to to to, sh to show. Uh, and uh, a few a few years later, we decided to see if you may be able to explore these ideas for hybrid uh, uh, electric uh, uh, vehicles. And um, the specific vehicle we were looking at uh, was actually quite interesting. Uh, its configuration is shown here. Uh, first of all, it had a diesel engine. Um, and uh, in addition, it had uh, not a single electric motor, but two motors. So the first one was up front. This was crank integrated starter generator uh, motor. And then there was a motor on the back, uh, electric uh, rear axle drive. Um, there were interesting things done on transmission side, automated manual transmission. There was also a coupler between front and uh, rear axle for 4x4 capabilities, high voltage battery, um, and on the after-treatment side, uh, diesel engines also run lean, and you typically need some kind of uh, lean, uh, lean after-treatment, at blue type of uh, system. Uh, but in this particular case, we were interested in running without um, after-treatment for NOx, but having after-treatment for particulates. So there was a diesel particulate filter. And so the idea here was to rely on uh, features of this powertrain being hybrid, the fact that you have a battery, in such a way as to uh, um, 
uh, to uh, to uh, reduce NOx to to, to required uh, to required levels. So in a way, uh, it's an interesting idea that you could uh, in a hybrid powertrain you could uh, use the battery in a way in a role of a catalyst, or at least you know to to remove some of the uh, some of the. Um, um, a chemical chemical components, if of course you're successful. Um, just as an illustration of some interesting modes, this vehicle can uh, run uh, in. Uh, so this is an uh, um, uh, electric vehicle mode for traction. Uh, so this is the front uh, of the vehicle. So the engine here is shut down uh, and we using the battery to uh, uh, through the electric motor, through the ERAD to uh, um, create traction on uh, the rear wheels, right? So the, the vehicle can move uh, forward. Uh, here's another possibility, still engine is shut down, but uh, if you are braking, you could uh, use regenerative uh, braking to charge uh, the high voltage uh, battery. Um, now here's a uh, opportunity to run uh, this vehicle with engine only uh, mode. So the engine is uh, creating uh, traction. Uh, this is a parallel hybrid mode with uh, boost, um, and so here, uh, both the engine and uh, the the motor, the rear motor, are running together, and so this is uh, probably something that you could use for maximum acceleration. Um, uh, and then uh, this is a parallel hybrid mode with recharge, uh, where you run uh, the engine not only to um, um, uh, apply uh, power to the wheels, but also to charge the high voltage battery. So it gives you some ideas that this is a fairly flexible uh, system and it's a nice uh, uh, playground. Uh, so what are the objectives uh, in this uh, problem? So first of all, it's a hybrid electric vehicle. So the idea was to balance the high voltage uh, battery state of charge. Um, um, the second objective, so basically maintain the state of charge of the battery, uh, not, not let it uh, drop or um, uh, um, well, or, or kind of on average. Um, and then the second one was to control emissions and then uh, minimize uh, fuel consumption. So what the kind of a cost function can one pick? Uh, well, you could pick something like this where you uh, uh, minimize the fuel times some coefficient alpha plus beta times uh, uh, NOx uh, uh, plus uh, a term that penalizes deviation of state of charge from um, desired state of charge. Uh, and then uh, again, we need to add a term that um, uh, somehow penalizes the actions of the first uh, player, which is the, 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 the drive cycle. So here, um, to drive, the, the first player would specify wheel speed and wheel torque in this case. Uh, the uh, U would basically be a uh, powertrain mode. And then the state would be battery state of charge, and you could include other states if you so desire, such as temperature in this formulation. After evaluating several choices, uh, we looked at a short horizon of uh, four steps uh, for generating the, the, the policy. And this is just to mention how we pick this uh, G of W term, which penalizes the actions of the leader. Uh, and the idea here was to look at where um, the vehicle would normally operate uh, uh, in terms of wheel torque and wheel speed, and essentially uh, uh, put a maximum in that in that range uh, as the first player trying to maximize the cost. So it would uh, uh, try to to, uh, to to essentially drive the operation in you know, closer to that to closer to that region. Uh, this is just a formal more formal definition of some of the modes that we used. Uh, these are actions of uh, the. Uh, um, uh, of the um, second player of the follower. Uh, and here we had an electric vehicle mode where we only have um, a, a rear motor to satisfy the driver torque demand at the wheels. Um, there was engine only mode, EV to parallel mode. This is primarily where the engine is starting up. There was a set of uh, four parallel charging modes and then a set of uh, four uh, uh, boosting modes. And there is more details in some of the papers that we wrote how we define those. Uh, so we turned the crank on the computations and constructed uh, our feedback stack in Berk equilibria. Um, this is actually uh, a picture of uh, the uh, implementation. There is a game theory map, but it's only one component uh, in the implementation. 
uh, as you often find, is that you have a solution, but you have to build some ancillary um, elements uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, parts of the problem that you haven't accounted for um, in the design are also handled. For example, there is a mod arbitration block here that uh, might um, uh, override some of the uh, modes that, um, um, that the game theory map is providing in case um, um, this mods cannot be used depending on vehicle, vehicle operating uh, conditions. Um, some of the simulations uh, on high fidelity model, and here we optimize the operation primarily for uh, fuel uh, economy, so we didn't put large penalty on, uh, on, uh, on NOx. And here is a comparison, uh, so we have a, a conventional uh, uh, controller in this vehicle, which is rule-based. Uh, we have deterministic dynamic programming, and that gives a 7.8% improvement over um, an ADC driving cycle. Uh, and this is the maximal possible improvement that you can get in terms of a fuel economy. And a big chunk of that be able to get using the game, uh, game theory solution that, uh, that, uh, that was developed. Um, um, so we were um, quite happy with the results. And then um, in terms of experimental vehicle testing, here we tested um, um, a solution that was also optimized for uh, NOx uh, uh, emissions. And uh, it was the vehicle was tested on a number of driving cycles. Uh, and one of the interesting features that we liked is the fact that we've been able to uh, improve oxide of nitrogen emissions uh, uh, across uh, several, uh, uh, several driving cycles. And there is more details um, of uh, this work uh, in uh, in the paper that uh, that uh, that uh, we wrote, and this paper appeared in uh, 2014. So, if you're interested in this uh, uh, details, um, uh, they are contained in this paper. Um, if um, and if you would like uh, to to have a copy of it, I can also email it to you. Okay, so this is uh, my second uh, example, and. Uh, what I'd like to do next is to talk about the third uh, example, where we look at these ideas for uh, automated driving. And uh, in my first lecture, I already talked about uh, automated vehicles, and I discussed some of the issues that are, um, that are involved in uh, automated uh, uh, driving. Um, and we discussed the fact that there is a growing proliferation of uh, um, advanced driver assistance systems, as well as automated driving uh, um, functions. Uh, current focus is on level two um, and uh, level uh, three type of uh, um, automated uh, uh, systems. Uh, the, um, and so if you think about control of automated vehicles, uh, this is a very large area and you have to think about all of this chain from advanced sensing to uh, processing the sensor information and essentially perception aspects, localization aspects, uh, to planning, uh, starting from high level route planning to uh, more of a uh, strategic and tactical planning uh, of uh, specific uh, maneuvers and specific trajectories. Uh, and uh, then uh, these trajectories are commanded to vehicular level control that then tracks those, those trajectories. Uh, so the previous examples that I showed were really at that at this level, at uh, VQ, uh, actually at powertrain or engine control level. Uh, but now we are thinking about how to apply uh, game theoretic ideas uh, in this block here, which is the planning, uh, um, uh, planning uh, maneuver planning uh, level. Now, what are some of the challenges in? Uh, um, automated driving, uh, well, uh, you have to assure that automated vehicles have the correct functionality and they are also safe. Um, and for that, um, one of the challenges is validation and verification. Uh, you have to drive uh, millions of miles on the road to be able to, to, to do that. Um, and um, that, uh, that is not uh, fully practical. So part of the VNB you have to do in simulation or in virtual world based on models. And so we'll see that some of these ideas are helpful in creating simulators for, 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 for a VNB. Uh, furthermore, uh, this type of scenarios where um, the game theoretic ideas are useful, I believe, are those where you have 
high degree of interactions between different uh, traffic participants. And so let me show a video. Uh, here we have an automated vehicle right here. And it's trying uh, to merge into very dense traffic. Now it's trying to be safe, not to collide with any other uh, vehicles. Uh, and uh, it's probably being quite conservative uh, because it has to, if you are a human driver, to be able to uh, merge, you have to kind of nudge your way in, right? You have to try uh, uh, to move into that lane and see if uh, someone will let you in or fall behind and, uh, and go, uh, 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 go maybe uh, on the back. And so this is uh, the type of situations where there is a high degree of interactions, meaning that if you say, well, I want to do this, uh, meaning that interactions here, what it means is that if you're trying to predict trajectories of vehicles around you, they will actually depend on what you do, right? So your trajectory will actually influence trajectories of uh, the vehicles around you. And that's a setting where, uh, once again, one can employ game theoretic models to improve the prediction. By the way, of course, uh, uh, there are um, other situations in traffic, uh, for example, uh, intersection, in particular, unsignalized intersection crossing, or even uh, lane changes where there are multiple um, uh, vehicles doing something. Um, they also um, have, um, um, have this uh, highly interactive behavior. So, uh, how we can leverage game theory uh, to model interactions within traffic? Uh, well, so first we can uh, try to uh, reproduce and simulate interactive traffic environments for uh, validation and verification of automated driving algorithms. So the goal is to create a simulator um, uh, where you can uh, take your automated driving algorithm, see how it would interact with other vehicles, um, is the idea that these vehicles won't be just driving at constant speed around you, but they will actually react to what you, you, you're going to do. Uh, now, the other uh, uh, use of game theory here is to be able to predict other drivers' interacting behaviors uh, to actually implement game theoretic models in automated driving strategy. And uh, one of most common ways how automated dri driving strategies are currently built is using model predictive control. Uh, many developers use this type of, uh, this type of uh, methods uh, at, at, uh, at the moment. Uh, and so um, the idea would be to try to uh, do prediction and model predictive control using game theoretic models. Roughly speaking, that, that, that's what's going on. Now, what are potential advantages of the approach? Uh, so one um, is uh, something called interpret interpretability explainability. Uh, that is, actions would be connected to optimizing cost functions and models uh, that reflect uh, driving goals, but also uh, they can be made to reflect uh, human behavior to some extent. Uh, now, why is it important? Uh, many systems that are built uh, on automated driving they may use uh, learning, including end-to-end -end, uh, learning. And so then uh, the challenge is to try to understand why a specific action has been, uh, has been, has been taken. Um, so here there is a, a potential opportunity to link uh, those, those actions uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, cost functions and models, perhaps in a better way that provides explainability for why certain actions have been taken. Uh, reduce conservatives while maintaining safety, so nudging your way into traffic by, when merging, that becomes uh, possible. Uh, and finally, the approach we think can be made comparatively data light, uh, as again compared to more um, uh, machine learning oriented approaches, uh, where you need a lot of data to be able to train uh, the, the, the strategy. So here, you still need data, of course, but uh, you use the data for parameter calibration as well as for, uh, for, for validation. So whenever you want a, a solution that is data light, doesn't require a lot of data for the development, model-based approach is a good, is a good uh, potential, uh, potential approach to follow, and this, is, this, is also, this also happens here. 
Uh, now, uh, how do we sort of uh, uh, put this problem in a framework where uh, game theoretic modeling can be applied? Uh, so first, uh, we typically don't have two players here. We might have multiple, uh, multiple players, multiple vehicles, for example, crossing the, the, the intersection. Uh, the um, uh, vehicle state uh, here, uh, each vehicle, for example, might have a certain position and certain velocity. This, this could be uh, uh, the state of the vehicle. Uh, the action could be acceleration. Uh, and then the traffic state, um, and here there is a bold S as opposed to non-bold S. So the bold S, it's essentially aggregation of all the states of the vehicles. Uh, and so you could think about uh, transition uh, uh, from current state, uh, given current actions of all the vehicles, to next state. Uh, and in principle, these transitions can be uh, uh, stochastic. So that, that, that is also allowed. We are not going to dwell too much on stochastic models in, in this talk. And then, of course, you need a driver reward. And a driver reward pretty much maps the state of the traffic as well as actions that are being taken to reward of the individual driver. And the reward of the individual driver depends on the traffic state, but also on actions of all the players. Right? This is where the interaction and games uh, come in. And then uh, uh, you might have an observation model that says that uh, um, you observe part of the traffic state, and then the driving policy is a mapping between the, this uh, state and, and action. And just to make it even more uh, concrete, in an intersection setting, you might say that, well, here's my intersection. I'm going to assume that my vehicles follow um, uh, certain curves over this intersection. And so my uh, state of the vehicle is going to be position along this curve, as well as the velocity along this curve, and my action is going to be acceleration. And then in terms of my reward, I might think about uh, penalizing collisions or violating some kind of separation distance constraints. Um, as well as running off the sides of the road here, uh, as well as uh, I could have a reward if I'm moving through intersection at high velocity, right? so I want to move through the intersection faster. Now, these are some of the uh, models that we have been uh, exploring in, uh, in our research. Uh, and um, uh, roughly, they consider, uh, they consist of several classes. So one of them is something we call level K uh, game theoretic models. They're also sometimes called cognitive hierarchy or bounded rationality models. Um, the idea here is to classify human behavior into different levels of reasoning. And a level K agent behaves as if all the other participants in a scenario are level K uh, minus uh, one. And I'll explain a little bit more what this means. The second framework is the leader follower games framework, stacker like. So it's a closer related to the first two examples that I, I spoke about. Um, and here, players have asymmetric roles. There is a leader and a follower, and the leader moves first, and the follower responds to the leader's uh, move. And I'll uh, illustrate that uh, in a traffic, you have traffic rules, and often these traffic rules um, set the roles of the leader and the follower. And you can reflect them in the formulation of this um, uh, game problem. Uh, and then uh, more recently, we looked at the application of potential games, which is a special cl class of games uh, for which um, uh, rewards of all players can be derived from a single global potential function in a way. Uh, and then players uh, take actions according to the minimum of this potential function, which is a Nash equilibrium in this game. And it has a certain scalability um, advantages that, uh, that we were after. A um, little bit about um, um, some of these uh, modeling approaches. So the first one is the level K game uh, theory uh, models. The idea is that you classify human behavior according to levels of reasoning. Uh, and in terms of the um, driving situations, you could think about different skill level or different aggressiveness level of the drivers. Uh, so, for example, you could say that level zero driver in a highway setting is a driver that uh, doesn't change lane and if it counters a vehicle up front, just decelerates and follows that, that, uh, that vehicle. Uh, then level one uh, driver is going to act as if everybody else around is level zero. So in this case, a level one driver is going to be very aggressive because 
And the level one driver assumes that no one changes lanes, so I can do whatever I want. And then level two driver is going to be, again, very conservative because uh, it has to interact with level one drivers. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, or you can do the reverse. You can define level zero uh, policy, for example, for intersection crossing as a reckless driver that just goes through, right? And then level one will assume that everybody is reckless. Uh, I, I typically, uh, typically more conservative, maybe not, not to an extent assuming that everybody will go through, but I'm probably closer to level one in this case. And then level two will be again aggressive because essentially the responsibility for preventing accidents would be to level one uh, type of uh, drivers. Uh, now, um, uh, turns out that uh, there is a, a, a literature, a large literature on uh, this type of uh, approaches uh, um, outside of driving. And it turns out that in some situations, uh, this uh, type of uh, modeling, they are more accurate in predicting human behavior versus equilibrium models. Um, um, so um, this is just an equation that summarizes what I'm what I'm saying. If I'm trying to design a policy for the ice driver and the policy has level k, I'm basically optimizing my reward over some horizon of n steps here. I used to have horizon as capital T, now it's capital N. I'm maximizing my cumulative reward, which is denoted by R super i. And then I'm assuming that all other players act according to k minus one uh, level uh, level policy. I use expected value here. Um, again, this detail is not important for today's discussion, but um, we do look at situations where, where either the policy, the reward, or state transitions are randomized. So this just allows us to handle more general type of uh, situations. Um, there are some known examples of level key reasoning and games. A classical example, this, uh, this is outside of uh, driving, but just to show you, there's, there's this uh, Keynesian beauty contest. You have a group of people, each pick a number between 0 and 100, and the winner is a person whose number is closest to half of the average of um, uh, uh, all the participant guesses. So a level zero player would choose a number pretty much non-strategically, maybe 50, right, to be, uh, to be in the middle. Level one player would say, well, everybody else is going to be level zero, so I better choose 25, right, uh, because everybody will pick 50. And then level two then would uh, choose uh, 13, uh, half of uh, everybody on, on level uh, one, and so on and so forth. Um, and it seems like um, uh, in, uh, in other type of uh, game situations, uh, it has been determined that uh, human players uh, are often uh, level 0, 1, and uh, 2. So they don't get maybe much higher than 2. And there is also connection with uh, other games, like, for example, game of uh, uh, poker, where there is some evidence of uh, level behavior. Now, for us, uh, the framework of level key games is quite convenient. Uh, because it allows us to train uh, agents by one by one. So we define level zero policy. We then uh, define a traffic environment full of level zero agents. And then we learn the level one uh, policy and we use a tool called reinforcement learning. And uh, if you haven't heard about it, the idea, it's a dynamic programming, but this dynamic programming uh, uses essentially interactions with the environment to improve the optimality of the of the policy. Ultimately, it's trying to do, it's after the same thing as dynamic programming, but it does this through the interactions and through the experimentations with the environment. And so we're able to train then a level one agent, then we create environment of level one agents, and we're able to train level two agents, and so on and so forth. And uh, more details about uh, this uh, type of ideas can be found in uh, uh, papers that uh, my colleagues and I have written. Um, and so uh, uh, if you apply this to a uh, highway driving situation, uh, you might have your ego vehicle, the one that uh, uh, that runs your, your, the one that you train, uh, and then the yellow vehicles are of um, our previous uh, level. You might have equations of motion that uh, describe uh, longitudinal lateral position of your vehicle, at least in the kinematic sense. Uh, you have observations. Uh, you can measure relative distances to at least vehicles nearby, and as well as uh, relative velocities. And then actions that you, you can take, uh, 
would be things like maintaining speed, accelerating, decelerating, um, changing lanes, and so on and so forth. And then the reward somehow would uh, penalize constraint violation, including collisions, velocity. You want to drive fast through this type of uh, segments, uh, headway, uh, and an effort. You don't want to constantly change lanes and uh, constantly accelerate, decelerate. So you want to also have a penalty um, on, on that. And the, the details of the design of the cost is, is, is in the papers. Uh, now, uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but for reinforcement learning uh, of training these agents, we use Jack Holler reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, they, um, um, they are versions of reinforcement learning for situations where you don't have, uh, you don't have full uh, measurement of the state. So essentially, it's a kind of an output feedback version of uh, reinforcement uh, learning. Um, and there are two steps. There is a policy evaluation and policy update. Uh, that uh, that um, uh, that you take, and in some situations there are certain convergence guarantees uh, um, uh, for 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 Jack Hall reinforcement learning, and so this is a tool that that that, that we have been using. And so then uh, that allows us to train uh, uh, various levels of uh, drivers uh, uh, for simulators, um, and this is something that we would use for VNV. Uh, and so here, there, for example, a mixture of uh, uh, driver simu simulation environment, which uh, might have a mixture of uh, different levels of drivers, um, for example, 10% level 0, 60% level 1, and 30% level 2. And if you're interested in testing your uh, specific automated driving algorithm, you might put it in this environment and see if you might discover some corner cases where you might have collisions with some vehicles. Uh, or some uh, some constraint violations, and then analyze the corner cases and try to see if you have to um, modify your strategy in a certain way, or perhaps this corner case is is uh, is, uh, is not going to occur in practice. So you could analyze it as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, there is. I mean, in principle, this this should also be uh, running. Uh, we integrated some of this with uh, Torx, which is a, a open source simulator. Um, and uh, there was a recent paper by researchers uh, from uh, Ford, and they had a kind of a more visually appealing simulator, and they appear to be uh, using some of the level K uh, ideas in some, some form in their simulator as well. Uh, intersection models, intersection scenarios, you could uh, also um, um, uh, uh, train uh, uh, level K uh, uh, um, drivers for this type of uh, scenarios. So here we have this uh, blue car, which could be level two or level one. And then you could see its aggressiveness. Uh, if it's level one, it's not very aggressive. It waits for everybody before taking the maneuver. And if it's level two, it, uh, it, it's more aggressive and goes through this uh, intersection. Um, we've looked at real data since there is uh, quite a few videos uh, showing how vehicles navigate in uh, traffic and uh, compare it with what um, uh, some of these uh, models uh, uh, predict. Uh, now, uh, one uh, more recent extension of this work has been uh, to look also at uh, training policies uh, to, for combined automated driving, but also accounting for energy management, so eco-driving um, together with automated driving. And what you do in this case is that you extend your state with something like battery state of charge in case of battery electric vehicle. And then your reward uh, would also uh, include energy efficiency. So the higher energy efficiency you, you have, the, the better off uh, uh, you are. And so that's an interesting study because um, um, we try to avoid, uh, we, we try to drive us, us in a smoother way, uh, try to avoid uh, unnecessary braking in order to, uh, to, um, uh, to maintain efficiency um, high. So this is uh, the work that we've done using level K models. And this is another framework that we looked at uh, with the leader follower games. These are Stackenberg-like uh, models. And uh, the motivation here comes from the fact that in many traffic scenarios, uh, driver's behavior is dominated by the intention whether or not to yield the right of way to others. And in fact, often this is also dictated by the rules of the, of the road, by the traffic rules. 
so the roles then uh, so the vehicles uh, can have different roles and there is a leader follower asymmetry uh, which can be exploited uh, in Stackelberg game theory to represent driver driver's intentions and so basically leader is a driver who intends to proceed and then the follower is a driver who intends to, uh, to yield uh, now uh, uh, this is how we um, uh, define uh, the decisions in this setting using um, leader follower framework. Uh, there are equations here, and I, I think uh, I'll just tell you what, what is the basic idea. Um, so the follower basically tries to maximize the worst case reward that the follower is able to obtain from interactions with, with, other, with, uh, with the leader, pretty much. Then the leader, knowing that uh, th th that vehicle is the leader, it tries to maximize the reward, but then knowing that uh, the follower is going to uh, try to maximize the worst case reward. So that, that fixes the situation and then allows to uh, define, um, define both, both actions. Um, and how to decide which vehicle is the leader as a follower? Well, one way is to use uh, traffic rules. Uh, the other way is not to be sure, but kind of infer online, uh, uh, whether, whether through interactions, whether someone is a leader and follower. And I'll say a few words about this uh, very shortly. But certainly there is enough uh, kind of rules in, uh, um, for example, if two vehicles come to an intersection at the same time, in the US, the vehicle on the right have, have the right of way. Um, so. That they can be can be used to um, be reflected in this case. Uh, now, uh, uh, what I just mentioned is for pairwise two vehicle interactions. Turns out that it's also possible to think about what happens uh, when you have uh, n vehicle uh, n vehicles where n is larger than uh, two, and essentially you have to look at pairwise interactions in, in a certain way and figure out how to inform their reward and how. How to make sense of the of the reward in the situations? I will not go through the details, but uh, they are in the paper that um, is mentioned here on the bottom. Um, so we looked at uh, various uh, videos of traffic scenarios and convinced ourselves that uh, we can uh, tune these models to be able to replicate uh, what actually happens. For example, when you have multiple vehicles uh, navigating in an unsignalized uh, uh, intersection scenario. These are more complex uh, sort of intersections uh, uh, where we have here a, a Google map view and then there's a street uh, view and we have multiple vehicles coming that are trying to navigate uh, this, uh, these scenarios and so you could uh, build pretty much uh, simulators where the vehicles uh, um, navigate for this type of intersections and once again if you have your own strategy to test what it would do in a scenario like this, you could you could try to add it uh, to this uh, to the simulator. Okay, so very briefly, how do we move beyond simulator to actual automatic driving strategy? So, um, what uh, because initially our focus has been on trying to develop simulation environments, but then we realized we can exploit these ideas also um, for um, operating vehicles. Uh, and uh, the picture that, or the framework that uh, we are working on, and this is still a work in progress, I would say, um, is basically shown here. So we have um, a bank of game theoretic uh, models, so not typically not a single model, but multiple models. For example, this could be different levels, or um, some of these models could be leader models or follower models, or have different parameters. And what we try to do uh, is that we try to uh, use observations to update the probability of other vehicles being uh, being reflected by one of these uh, models. For, for example, we might uh, observe what vehicles around us do, and we might assign a probability of this being a leader or being a follower. Maybe initially it's 0.5, but then as we interact, we might uh, uh, make some uh, make some updates. So in this, uh, some of the simulations that show that we. Uh, uh, during the merging, this is a forced merging scenario where we have to nudge our way in. Uh, we we uh, um, do this Bayesian model inference uh, to um, understand which model might uh, uh, might be more suitable for 
and each of the vehicles that we interact with. Uh, but then we have to decide on our own trajectory and plan our own trajectory. So for that, we use uh, stochastic or scenario-based model predictive control, where we say, well, these are the possible trajectories of the surrounding vehicles, and then uh, we're able to optimize, optimize our trajectory, um, assuming, uh, well, it's not just trajectory of surrounding vehicles, but actually models that respond to our trajectory, and then we do optimization uh, in the stochastic MPC framework. So again, the details are some of the papers, but I hope that this uh, picture gives a little bit of our flavor. Uh, we've uh, tested uh, this type of uh, uh, forced merging uh, um, controllers, if you like, uh, on uh, data sets, publicly available uh, data sets, US 101 and high D data sets. Um, now here, these are basically recordings of the traffic uh, so strictly speaking, they, they don't, they are not interactive because the vehicles do what they do. Uh, but we can put our vehicle and see whether it's, it's able to successfully merge. And we have fairly high uh, rate of uh, success in this uh, merges. Um, and um, uh, this slide simply shows that uh, um, we could uh, build this uh, framework around level K models uh, in the first merging, we typically estimate the probability of a vehicle being a leader or being a follower, but we can also build um, um, build systems that um, that estimate the the uh, probability of particular vehicle being uh, um, level zero or level one or level two uh, to driver. Um, and so this uh, framework that I showed, where we do some inference online through interactions, and then uh, uh, we uh, decide on our actions. It's actually useful beyond uh, automated driving. And just for fun, we looked at, <laughs> at a game which is called Penny Matching Game. Um, and it's a very simple game. Uh, the computer, so there is basically two trees and there is a price which is uh, in the ground be below one of the trees. And the computer places it beyond, below one of the trees. And the human guesses. And so you either guess right, and if you guess right, then you get a reward, or you guess wrong, then you don't, uh, you, you get, uh, you, you get a penalty, right? And so on average, if the computer places uh, um, the uh, price uh, in random and the human guesses at random, um, you know, you should be right about 50% of the time, right? Uh, but it turns out that humans are not able to make random decisions. Uh, they are not very good random number generators. And so you can build a system which tries to model their decisions, uh, uh, particular level zero, level one, level two, and through interactions, you could kind of update the probabilities of which level they are at. Uh, and then that informs your own actions. Um, and uh, it's a very simple uh, application, but uh, in terms of um, experiments, uh, this proposed, which we called AI uh, algorithm, it beats 90% of human, uh, human players. And uh, the details are in the paper. So if you're interested in this example, I'd be very happy to, uh, to send the paper, the paper to you. Um, I th how much time do I have? I think I'm probably uh, getting close to I know this a little bit. I'll just very quickly um, discuss potential game-based models, um, and then I'll finalize uh, the um, finalize the conclusion. Uh, so the potential games, it's a separate class of games that has nice uh, properties, uh, but the key is to have this global potential function that connects each player's rewards. And uh, this is kind of the main equation, if you like. So f here is the potential function. And what this says is that if I have a player i, and uh, the player i deviates from its action, so you go from a super i to a super i to a super i prime, and all other players, uh, they keep their actions, then the change in the reward can be derived from this uh, potential function. So that's a, um, that's the property of, uh, uh, of a, a potential game. Now, the nice uh, feature of potential games is that uh, it's relatively straightforward to find Nash equilibria. 
uh, and they are simply at the minimum of the potential function. So really, the game problem reduces to trying to minimize a function which which can be um, which can be done uh, uh, relatively easily. Uh, and so then this has a promise of being um, uh, scalable to um, to uh, to um, uh, more complex traffic uh, scenarios. So we've been playing um, uh, with this type of uh, models. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, when are this potential game framework applicable? Well, the reward has to satisfy certain properties. For example, uh, the reward could consist of, uh, uh, of a reward of um, a single uh, player. So, so the, this is the reward that the player I derives. It should depend on its action. This is fine. And it can also depend on pairwise actions. Uh, so this is uh, another function, phi i j, which is a function of uh, play of uh, player i and j. And this uh, pairwise rewards, they have to be symmetric. So that's one of the key, uh, key assumptions. Now, if you don't have this property, sometimes you can approximate a non-potential game, this potential game, and there is a theory, there is literature on how to do that, but generally it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a property. Uh, but uh, uh, in automated driving setting, for example, if you look at relative distance, because each vehicle wants to uh, doesn't want no one wants to collide, and so if you think about, uh, for example, um, a penalty on a relative distance, that would uh, satisfy this uh, pairwise symmetric uh, assumption, right? Uh, uh, the distance between A and B is the same as the distance between B and A, roughly speaking. So there is actually classes of situations where this potential game framework is uh, is applicable. So we've been uh, looking at uh, what it gives us. Um, another idea that we've exploited more recently is the predictor character potential, potential games. Uh, and the idea here is that if our estimate of the reward uh, of uh, the other players is wrong, we can observe the actions and make certain correction steps, um, and that uh, helps to, uh, let's just say, improve robustness uh, of uh, this type of decisions. I'm not going to say more about uh, potential games. Once again, the details are in some of the papers that I'll be very happy to share. Uh, but this is a slide that summarizes uh, uh, some of our conclusions from looking at uh, different um, formulations and different game theoretic models uh, for automated driving. And uh, um, if I were to, uh, to state, uh, there is, I don't think there is a perfect approach or the approach that's better than, uh, than anything else. Uh, each approach has its own strengths and uh, weaknesses. Uh, but certainly, depending on application scenario, uh, some approaches may be more suitable than others. For example, level K games may be very suitable for uh, highway driving and overtaking and intersection. Uh, be the follower games when you have more clear picture of the rules. Uh, um, they're, they're a good uh, tool. We certainly found them very useful for forced merging uh, scenarios, which has been a challenge, one of the key challenges in automated driving. Um, and then um, uh, there is a number of um, um, nice features to uh, potential games and all situations where you can uh, exploit them. Uh, and so this brings me pretty much to a summary of uh, key points uh, for, for my talk um, um, and a summary of, of basically what I, what I, what I try to discuss. Uh, so first of all, um, game theoretic modeling optimization applied at a single powertrain level uh, results in cycle independent and implementable engine powertrain control policies. Um, uh, in terms of automated driving, game theoretic methods, they lead to interpretable models to represent heterogeneous interacting behavior of road users on shared roads. Um, these models can be used to create interactive traffic simulators for virtual testing and reinforcement learning based training of autonomous vehicle control policies that can also be used in trajectory prediction modules of um, autonomous vehicle control systems. In the, and uh, for the later, integration of game theoretic models with Bayesian inference and model predictive control uh, leads to what we call interaction aware, human interaction aware control framework, autonomous vehicles on shared roads, 
and uh, that can account for interaction uncertainties. And uh, uh, there is a certain guarantee that you can also obtain this with these approaches as well. Um, and uh, the other point that I want to make is that uh, these game theoretic methods can be applied to other multi-agent or human-robot interaction problems beyond automated vehicles. Um, very recently, we, we tried to think about uh, sort of a human uh, um, a robot robot interactions in home robotics type uh, uh, setting where you uh, your robot has to move around the humans and interact with humans in certain ways. And we think that some of these ideas uh, can be um, can be exploited there as well. Uh, and so this uh, pretty much uh, completes my presentation. I uh, greatly appreciate you all coming to my uh, my, my talk and uh, for for listening to it. Thank you so much.